Take your Bible tonight. Let's go to the book of 2 Kings. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. I'll ask you to stand to your feet tonight. This message, if I'll let it, will get long on me, and I do not want that to happen tonight. Uh, I appreciate Brother Jeff singing, uh, Seeing the Light. As I deal with that message, this message tonight, I will get there to that point. And that's really what I want to focus on, if I could. Is It's going to take me a little while to get there tonight, but when I do, I really want us to understand the importance of our opportunity that we have while we're here. Uh, because if, if the Lord don't come back soon, uh, some of us are going to leave out of here. And what we've done and what we've left behind, all that's going to matter. Uh, we can't take a lot of, and I know we lay up treasures in heaven. I understand that. I, I get that. I know what the Bible says in Matthew 6. He talks about uh, laying up treasures in heaven where moth or rust uh, doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. And I think we need to lay up treasures uh, over there. But it's what we do while we're here uh, that's going to matter for the Lord Jesus tonight. And I'm going to try to reconcile that with this verse here out of 2 Kings chapter 2. Uh, look, begin to read with me in verse 9. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 9, It came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, I ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken away from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked. And as I've always said, I'd like to know what they talked about. I'd like to be a little privy to that, to that conversation. You've got two men of God, one knowing that he's fixing to leave, had just parted Jordan a few minutes ago and crossed over on dry ground. I really wonder what these boys was talking about going that way, you know. And so when it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in pieces, in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. You can be seated tonight. Heavenly Father, help us now for just a little while to preach. We need help from heaven. Please come by and touch tonight. Give us an unction from the Holy One. I pray somebody lost would get saved. And Lord, I pray we'd see the seriousness of this message tonight is that we need to leave something behind for you and what it means to do that. We love you and we thank you. Meet with us now for this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As I looked over this message today, I, I thought about what somebody said. I was listening to the radio the other day and uh, somebody had said a lot of people, they uh, wait till they die uh, to leave their money to people. And uh, he said if they would leave their money and give it away while they're still alive, they'd get to see it work while they're still here. Now, I'll be honest with you tonight. I like to see the work that I do for the Lord accomplish something while I'm still here. I really want to do something that means something and that to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the cause of Christ and uh, for the church that uh, uh, before I leave here, uh, I know that I have accomplished what the Lord would have me to do. But as Elijah was fixing to leave, I he asked Elisha, he said, what can I do for you before I go? And uh, he said, just give me a double portion uh, of what you have. Now, I'm going to tell you something, that was a tall order uh, uh, to get a double portion of what Elijah had. 
If you think about Elijah's life for just a minute, I I mean, we get introduced to Elijah back in 1 Kings chapter 17, and uh, the first time we get introduced to him, he stand before King Ahab, and he said, it's not going to rain until I say so. And uh, it don't rain for the space, the Bible said, how the Lord Jesus did, and also in the book of James, uh, that it didn't rain for the space of three and a half years. We know that during that time that God uh, fed Elijah down by the brook Cherith and uh, listen, as he drank from the brook, the ravens brought him mead uh, in the morning and in the evening. Uh, when the brook dried up, God sent him up to Zarephath and uh, there fed him out of the widow's house uh, uh, with just enough oil and enough meal uh, out of the mill barrel and the crews of oil uh, uh, that they wouldn't starve. Amen. There was always just enough. And that's a great miracle in itself if you go back and read that story and we can stand here and preach on that tonight. But it was in that same widow woman's house that her son died and Elijah raised him from the dead. You find that as he was on Mount Carmel that uh, he has a challenge and a battle over there with the, uh, with, with the prophets and that of Baal. I, Uh, And in 63 words that he prayed to heaven, uh, God answered by fire, sucked up the water, uh, uh, the sacrifice, the rocks, uh, uh, and scattered the dirt that was on the ground, if you let me say that. uh, uh, And God proved who he was. He uses Elijah, if you read on in 1 Kings chapter 19, he uses Elijah to anoint the king over Syria and uh, the king over uh, Israel and also uh, anoints Elisha in his place. And God even uses Elijah to confront Ahab about what he done to Naboth down there about his vineyard. Elijah meets the servants of the king of Samaria when he is sick and he goes down. He sends his servants to inquire of the God of Ekron and uh, and God says meet his servants on the way uh, and ask them why they're going to see the God of Ekron. They're not a God in Israel uh, and that to inquire of. He said, by the way, tell him he ain't going to get off his sick bed. And so that same king, he sends 50 as a matter of fact, they asked, he asked, who is he? What this man look like that met you in the way? And they began to tell him he was a hairy man that uh, wore a leather girdle and all these things. That, uh, he said, that's Elijah tonight. And by the way, everybody knew who Elijah was. Wasn't many people didn't know who Elijah was. And so when he sent them, that captain and 50 men out uh, uh, to go get Elijah, and he said to, uh, to come down off that mountain, Elijah just called fire down from heaven and burn them all up. And they done it again. You know what Elijah did? He called fire down from heaven uh, and burn them all up. And that third time when that captain uh, and them 50 men went up there to get Elijah, he fell down before Elijah uh, and he said, let me uh, and these men be precious uh, uh, in thy sight. He was smart. He asked for some mercy and grace is what he done. Would God tonight we could get folk to see that they need mercy and grace in their life and fall down and cry out for it tonight. I'm just trying to paint you a quick picture uh, uh, and that of Elijah tonight. Uh, uh, listen, and it was uh, uh, Elijah that met with Jesus and Moses uh, on Mount Transfiguration. And it was in the power of Elijah that John the Baptist came. And there is a lot of similarities, and I've preached on that over the years, of uh, uh, Elijah and John the Baptist. A lot of similarities. But when I looked at this, if you look here, he asked Elisha, uh, what do you want me to do? Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of my spirit be upon thee. And I began to think about this. I know I've preached on it. I probably, I think I preached on it back in April with this uh, thought uh, uh, on uh, what are we going to leave behind? And what can we leave behind? 
Uh, I want to be quick by way of introduction. Let me say real quick tonight that uh, one of the things that uh, you need to leave behind uh, is the assurance of your eternity. Uh, Men and women, your family, your children, your parents uh, uh, need to know where you're going when you die. Uh, I've preached to many funerals of uh, saints of God and I'm going to tell you it's it's a lot easier to stand uh, uh, behind that podium, behind that pulpit, and deliver that funeral message uh, and to go out there to that graveside uh, and commit that body back to the ground uh, uh, when you know you're going to see them one day after a while because they went to heaven. It's a lot easier to stand in that receiving line uh, uh, even though you're sad uh, and you're grieving uh, but you really understand for the child of God that I, I ain't the end and that won't be the last time I, I, that we'll see each other again. Whew. That excites me tonight. Hey, there's coming a day around the throne of God. Hey, then we're going to get together and we'll be parted never more. And that to say goodbye and that again. Yes. Boy, that tickles me tonight. I'm telling you, it tickles me. I don't know that we'll no longer have to say goodbye. But you don't need to have a question of your eternity. You need to know where you're going when you die. But your family needs to know where you're going. As I looked over this message late this afternoon, I thought about when Brother Alvin passed away. Him and Sister Carla used to sit back here right behind Brother Frankie and Miss Sue. And I, and I began to think about them. And I remember going out to the hospital uh, that night before he passed away. And I went out there to the 6 o'clock visitation and went in and seen him. And you know that joker, he never had hugged my neck in his whole life until that night. He was laying in an ICU bed and had that a BiPAP machine on him. And I was trying to breathe and he was struggling to breathe. I, I, when I went in that night, I, I to see him at 6 o'clock. He told me to come over there and he leaned up in that bed and gave me the biggest old hug. And you know, I didn't think nothing about it then. I didn't, I didn't think a thing about that, I, about why he done what he done. I'll get to my message in a minute. I'm having a good time. Amen. Amen. And I remember going in and hugging his neck. And I visited with him and the family and I was there maybe about 15, 20 minutes and I got out and went back home. And I remember me and Miss Kelly had done gotten to bed that night. It got late. And it was probably about 11, 30, 12 o'clock. And we hadn't laid in the bed too long. And, and this is back when we had a landline telephone, you know. And the phone rang. It was on her side of the bed. It was about midnight. And she picked up the telephone, and it was Miss Sue. And she handed it all over to me, and she said, Preacher, she said, if you want to see him again, you better get on out of the hospital. Said, he's about to leave out of here. So I just got up, put my clothes on, headed out the door and got out there. And he was leaving. Wasn't around too much longer when I got there. And I remember after the, I remember after the, uh, the kids left, they went outside. And it was just me and Miss Carla sitting in there. And that nurse had come in, that ICU nurse. And, uh, she was a Christian lady. And she knew I was the pastor. And she said, preacher, she said, uh, well, can we have prayer? No, I said, that'd be good. Let's have prayer. I don't know if I can pray, but we'll try. And I remember after I got done praying, it wasn't long that the Lord just smote my heart with some scripture that precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. And I remember that's what I preached on when it came his funeral time. And that was one of the most easiest delivering messages that I believe I'd ever preached at a funeral. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. And I remember many other funerals that we've preached that it was just easy. And you say, why was it easy? Because I knew where they were. I knew where they were. You don't have to worry about that. If you don't know where you're going tonight, you need to get that thing settled in your heart and in your mind uh, to know that you're going to heaven. And if you don't know that, uh, uh, you can come and get it settled tonight. The Lord wants to help you with that tonight. And did you do what the Bible said? Did you come and believe and trust Him and ask Him to save you? You know, the Bible said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I, I really believe that tonight. I believe that with all my heart. That if you come wanting, knowing that you're lost, wanting to get saved and ask Him to save you, 
He'll do that tonight. It is that simple. Thank God for that. Amen. You can say you believe in easy believism. You, you believe whatever you want to. I do believe it's easy to get saved tonight. But I do believe you've got to repent of your sin and ask Him to save you tonight. But I want to leave behind the no question. I want to leave behind the assurance of my eternity. And so let me say tonight that just real quick, I'm going to try to be very quick tonight. And I know I've said that and I'm just having a good time up here tonight. I'm having a real good time. Number one, in what do I want to leave behind? I want to be missed when I'm left behind, when we get left. Or when I leave here. I get it right here in just a minute. I ain't getting left behind. Thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Ain't you glad you ain't getting left behind tonight? About deflated that balloon, didn't I? The Bible said in Proverbs chapter 10 that the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. He said, what do you mean you want to be somebody that's missed tonight? Hey, I want to have such a, uh, such a spirit about me uh, uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, that when I leave out of here, folks are going to miss my life for Christ. I thought about this as I studied. I, I wonder when the church is raptured out, I, I wonder if people will really miss us tonight. Well, folk, look for us. You know, if you go on and you read about Elijah uh, in this chapter, you'll find out that the sons of the prophets come to Elijah uh, and, and said, can we go look for him? I said the Spirit of the Lord may have uh, took him somewhere uh, uh, and, and carried him away, uh, uh, but uh, he may be somewhere else. <clears throat> and the Bible said in verse 17, I talked to Elisha, these sins of the prophets, uh, and when they urged him till he was ashamed, uh, he said, Sin. And they sent therefore 50 men, and they sought three days, uh, but found him not. And they went and looked for him, but they uh, could not find him. Hey, Brother Jeff, are these microphones on right here, brother? They turned up. Hey, I'm getting a little echo up here, brother. Uh, when, uh, when they went to uh, look for Elijah, they couldn't find him. Why? Because the Lord had took him. But you know what? They've they been some folk, I'm going to be honest with you, that I just miss being around after they got took out of here. Now, I, listen, I know y'all got family that you miss because it's your mama or your daddy. And listen, you ought to miss your mom and your daddy tonight. Uh, but I, I'm talking about uh, uh, somebody that, and, and maybe your mom and dad had this kind of spirit. Uh, I, I mean, one that you just love to be around. Uh, uh, one that loved the Lord and you learned so much from them. Uh, uh, and they were just a friend to you. Uh, listen, when I leave out of here, uh, I just want somebody to miss. Uh, uh, listen, not me for me, uh, uh, but because of my testimony for Christ, uh, uh, because I serve Him, uh, I say, man, I miss Him. I sat down and I think about Brother Ted Pegram. They some of y'all, well, most of y'all ought to know Brother Ted. He preached revival here and preached our uh, dedication service to the church. And he was one of the first pastors to take y'all on, wasn't he, Brother Marvin? I think so. When y'all went on, when you was on the road, I believe Brother Ted was one of the first ones to do that. And uh, I miss him. You want to know why? Because he was my friend. And I miss him. But not only because of that, but he just had a spirit that, uh, listen, that was different to me. I, I listen, and, 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 and he, it was just, uh, just something that I, I wanted to be like, you know, if I could say that tonight. And uh, what's that say about us that uh, if we leave and nobody misses us? You know, being a good friend to somebody goes a long way, don't it? It really does. But when I leave out of here, I, and listen, I ain't looking to go anytime soon if the Lord will let me stay around. I hope so. As one feller said, I'm going to heaven. I just ain't getting a bus load up tonight. Amen. I'd like to get a bus load up and get them ready to go, wouldn't you, tonight? I'm going to deal with that here in a minute. But listen, when, when I leave here, I, I, want, I want somebody to miss my friendship. You know, it's good for a man to have friends, ain't it? 
It is. I mean, the Bible said that two's better than one and a threefold cord can't be easily broken. It's good to be a friend to somebody. Hadn't the Lord been a friend to you? Hadn't He been your friend all these years and helped you and been a light to you and been a direction to you and I listened and just hugged up on you and loved you? And you know something that I've learned about friendship? Friendship certainly does look over a lot of problems a lot of times. As I quoted this morning, you know love covereth a lot of sins, don't it? Not that we condone them, but I'm glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad folk looked over a lot of my problems over the years. I'll be honest with you. I'm glad they did. But I just want to be somebody that was missed in the Lord because of the spirit that I had. What kind of spirit do we have tonight? I hope the Holy Spirit resides inside, but I'm talking about one maybe that is, you know, the Bible talks about in Galatians chapter 5, those fruits of the Spirit of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. That kind of spirit tonight. When I leave, I hope that I'll be missed for the cause of Christ. When I leave out of here I hope that I've had good influence on people don't you want to have good influence on people be influential in somebody's life I thought about folk that has been influential in my life not all of them have been preachers by the way I know I talk about a lot of preachers that's what I am that's who I know but there's just been a lot of people that's been influential in my life over the years. I thought about Enoch. You know, the Bible talks about Enoch's faith. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. Reckon they looked for him? I bet they did. They looked for Elijah and could not find him. And again, I go back to that question again. Reckon they'll look for us when the church is raptured out of here. I think they will. I think there'll be some look for us. But he said he was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Reckon how much influential, influential our testimony is on people today. Everybody knew who Elijah was because of the power that he had with God. Everybody knew who Elijah was because of the life that he had with God. When we sell out to the Lord, I'm going to be honest with you tonight, church, it shines on us. Elijah had his problems. You know, if you go look in in, in the book of James over there, it says that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. You know what that means? He was dealing with the same flesh that you're dealing with. He was dealing with the same issues that you deal with. He de- and listen, I believe that Elijah was a man that dealt with oppression and depression and compression and, and all kinds. Do you, know, do you know the root word of all those things that I just said? You know what the root word is? Press. And I'm going to be honest with you. If you serve the Lord tonight, Satan's going to come by and press on you. He'll do that. And the more you serve God, the hotter the battle is always going to get. But I also know that the more you serve Him, the closer you'll get to Him and the closer He'll be to you. Draw nigh unto the Lord and He'll draw nigh unto you. I want to be an influence in people's lives. You know, Noah started with his wife and with his children, didn't he? Noah was influential, influential to his children. He got them on board the ark, didn't he? He may not have got anybody else on that ark. Nobody else may have wanted to get on that ark, but there was, there was seven other people uh, uh, that he got on that boat uh, besides himself. And that was his family. You know, the most people that you'll probably have the influence with will be your family. Noah, he Serve the Lord in a time when it was wicked. When men were evil. 
And men's hearts was on evil all the time. You know, if you go over to the book of Genesis, chapter 6, which deals with mankind's sin so much and deals with mankind, it's amazing that it's in chapter 6, ain't it? You know, 6 is the number of men. But you know, the Bible come down in verse 8 and said, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. You know, the only way that we're going to have influence on people in this day and time is if me and you walk with the Lord. I'm going to be honest with you. The only way we... Listen, we can tell people all day long what, uh, what we know that book says, but until we decide to live by that book and it shines out in our life, it ain't going to make a difference. I mean, it's kind of hypocritical to say one thing and walk another way, ain't it? I try to guard myself. I, listen, I got my problems. I know I've got my problems. Latham knows I've got my problems. Uh, listen, and I really do. But I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I try my best to follow this book and live by this book, by what it says to do. Do I get it right all the time? Probably not. But I try. I'm striving to read it and get it and try to understand it and then live by it. Why? Because I need to. I need to do that. I know that's pleasing to the Heavenly Father and to His beloved Son tonight that died for me so that I could get saved. I remember Brother Eric Peters preached that message one time. I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. Man, we owe him so much for what he done at Calvary. All I want to do is please him tonight. By the influence that we can have on other people. You cannot make yourself have influence on people, but you'll be amazed that just living before them, the light and the life of Christ, what kind of influence you'll have. Second Timothy chapter 1, Paul said, When I called remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. He said, you know, it started with your grandmother and it was in your mother. But he said, it's in you now because of the way they lived. I really believe that's what Paul was saying because of the way that they lived. I just want to be an influence for the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. I want to have that type of influence that folk knows what I believe and where I stand on things. I want to leave behind the very fact that this book that I have in front of me is what I live by, what we run our home by, what I pastor this church with, and what I pastor this church with. Like I say, I'm preaching this as if I'm already gone, but I just I hope I ain't leaving anytime soon. Amen. You know, I get to preaching like this and you get to thinking and wondering, you know. <laughs> See, the thing about this is we talk about what we wished. Let me ask you something. And, and I know y'all know this. I've told y'all this. Let me just make a statement and I'll ask you a question. I call my dad every weekday morning. I, I give him a break from me on the weekends. Everybody gets a day or two off, don't they? Amen. And I figure having to deal with me is, is one of them things you might need a break from. But you know why I call him every Monday through Friday, every morning, before I start my day most of the time? You know why I call him? Because I don't, I don't, I've heard too many people say, boy, I wish I would have. And you know, when you get to that point, when you say, I wish I would have, it's done too late. And sometimes how we live now, we need to understand that there's coming a day when we're going to say, boy, I wish I would have. I wish I'd have done this for the Lord. I wish I'd have said this when I had opportunity. I wish I would have testified. I wish I would have lived like this and done this. And it may even before you leave out of here that we make that statement. You go over to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 when it talks about when the evil days come. And that's not talking about wicked days. That's talking about when you get old and can't do what you wish that you could do. You know, that's why he talks about in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth before the evil days come. Why? Because there's going to come days that you just can't do it. 
I remember when me and Kelly first started dating and first got married and uh, me and Brother Bob, we'd work together and we'd go out there in the field and he'd always want to go get the tractor with a boom pole and pick something up and put it in the back of the truck or something. And I'd say, just pick that thing up and let's throw it in there. And he'd say, son, you get my age. He said, you're going to regret what you're doing right now. Right. And you know, I've learned everything that he said was true. All them times that I've picked stuff up, I've, I'm, I'm eventually going to have to be cut on because of all that picking stuff up, you know. You get to that place where you can't do what you wish that you could do. I don't want to look back and say, boy, I wished I'd have served God like the Bible said to serve Him. You, you know, you start to have regrets about when you could have done things and should have done things and should have went places and said some things and should have lived before people a different way. Uh, when I leave here, or when I get too old to pastor, let me say it that way, I, I want folk to know, I want folk to know today and man, it's, it's all about this book right here. Because inside this book tells me about him. Oh, yeah. Boy, them Sunday school teachers that, man, as a, as a boy at church that I was probably hard on because I was a boy and wide open. But they still had patience and taught this book. I think back about those ladies sometimes that as I grew up and me and Miss Kelly, we, although we didn't grow up in the same church, that uh, she could still remember her Sunday school teachers that she grew up with and the influence that they had. If you can give people this book right here, it'll have an influence on them. It'll change them. I'm glad I had some Sunday school teachers that loved the Lord and some preachers that loved God and would just preach. When the day comes that I leave out of here, I want you to know that not only do I love God, but I loved His book and wanted to live by it. I think that's what you ought to do today too is love God in this book. Try to learn. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman a workman that needs not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Last thing that I'd like to leave behind is some souls that I've won for the Lord. And if you, if you, don't, if you don't think of anything else tonight that I preach, I want you to really get this point. Is there's people around us dying and going to hell. And they're slipping off out of here every day. I know people's got numbers of how many it leaves every minute, every second that leaves and, and dies lost without Christ. I really don't know that number. I, I have no idea. But I do know this, that, that there are folk leaving out of here that are lost. And I, I want to have the influence with them that I might be able to win them unto him. As I looked at this, I, I thought about how poor of a job I do at witnessing. There was a time when I witnessed more than I do now. You can ask my wife. There's been times that I've seen folk just on the side of the road I'd pull in and talk to them. Talk to gas station attendants and folk at the gas pump and a little girl that would wait on us at the Wendy's. When's the last time you told anybody about the love of Christ? Jesus said in John chapter 4, Say not ye that there are four months and then cometh harvest. What's he talking about right there? You know, we, we plant a seed in the ground and then you have to wait for harvest time. He said, there, don't say there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. 
Now I love to see these youngins get saved in church and I love folk to come to church and, and, and get saved. I love that. But I'm going to tell you, we, we ain't knocking the, the walls down around here. There ain't a lot of folk coming in to get saved. And I'll be honest with you, you get them in here, I'll preach to them about the love of Christ and what he done at Calvary and what it means to be saved from hell. I'll tell them what it means, friend, if you'll get them in here. But I'm going to be honest with you tonight. They're out there, and we're going to have to win them. We're going to do it with the influence and the life that we live and by the book that we give them tonight. Born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. I'm telling you, if you can get a track in their hand, I, I remember what uh, uh, brother uh, man he uh, he slips my mind every time, and I, I can see him, brother Hensley. I can remember what brother Hensley said before he got saved. He said I was one of them fellers that would read them tracks. He said I may not read it in front of you, but he said I put it in my pocket and go home and read it and see what it had to say. I forget who was telling me the story of this. There was a couple, there was a man and a wife that had stopped somewhere and just picked up a track that had been left. And they took it home with them. And both of them got saved at home. They were on vacation and got saved when they got back home. And they finally found out that the church that had left that track because their name was on the back of it they found out that church was having camp meeting, so they made the trip back uh, to that church in the middle of camp meeting and then got up and testified in the middle of it all that it was because of that track that they got saved. You just never know what that track does. But I'm telling you, it's the Word of God that's inside of that thing that makes all the difference. I'm not saying I have to know how many people got saved. I just want to know. Listen, out of all the radio broadcasts that we're on, man, we're around. If, if you could just go on Sermon Audio and see how much we get downloaded and looked at all around the world, I hope to God that somewhere between all the preaching and all the living and all the witnessing and all the handing out tracts and leaving them, that somebody got saved. I hope so. Psalms 126. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy, and he that goeth forth weepeth, goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. If we go out and sow this seed right here, you remember the Bible talks about in Matthew chapter 13 that a sower went forth to sow. And he sowed some by the wayside. And he sowed some uh, on stony ground. And some on thorny ground. And some on good ground. Listen, he didn't say go look for the good ground. He just said go and sow. And when he gave us the meaning of that parable, he said the seed was the word of God. It ain't always going to fall on good ground. But you know, sometimes it does. It falls on good ground, and the Bible said, and it brought forth 30 fold, 60 fold, and 100 fold. And so the idea there is, is you get somebody saved, and then that person that got saved there, they'll get somebody saved. And while you're getting somebody over else here saved, they'll get somebody saved. The Bible said, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So Elijah asked him, he said, what, what do you want me to do for you? He said, ask me what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. I believe, now I'd have to go back and look. I, can't, I didn't look it up before I left the house, but I believe that Elijah had done seven miracles. 
And I believe Elisha done 14. I believe Elijah raised one from the dead and Elisha raised two from the dead. I'm trying to remember, I had to go back and count all that. But if you go back and you look, he said, what do you want me to leave? And he said, a double portion. And so the Bible said, and he saw him no more and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces and he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. When Elijah come by that day in 1 Kings chapter 19, let me go back and look at this, and then I'm going to close. 1 Kings chapter 19, God had told him to go call Elisha and call him into the ministry, if you'd let me say that. And so he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelve. And Elisha and Elijah passed by him, and here's what your Bible said, and cast his mantle upon him. So when Elijah found him, he was working. You know, that's where God finds people at, working. And he takes that mantle off and he throws it on him. And somewhere along the way, Elijah gets it back. But when he left out of here, that mantle fell from heaven and fell to Elisha. Elijah had a big influence on Elisha. But if you go on and you read about everything that Elisha done, he done twice as much as Elijah ever did. You know who you have an influence on and win to the Lord and do something for Him? You never know who, who might do more than you've done. You know, did the Lord not tell His disciples over there, greater work you'll do than, than I've done? All I'm saying is, while I'm here, I don't like to talk about leaving that much. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm going on 47 years old. And, I know, and, and listen, when you're in your 20s and in your 30s, you don't think about too much leaving here. But when you start getting to where I am, you begin to think about this stuff. You look at the obituaries of the morning time, and I do, by the way. I didn't used to like to look. I don't know what it is about the older you get, the more you look at the obituaries. I don't know. And I see people in there younger than I am leaving out of here. It makes you think about some things. Try not to get morbid, but it makes you think. But let me ask you something. What we leave behind is what we're doing right now. So what are we doing? Are we winning anybody to the Lord by the way that we live, by what we do, by the tracks we leave behind? What are we doing for them? Let's bow our heads.